Welcome to Civicast, which is a series of podcasts from the National Civic Impact Accelerator Programme, which is funded by Research England. I'm really pleased to be here at Toynbee Hall today, the Institute of Community Studies, and I'm really pleased to welcome Tanya Carrera, who is an Evidence Manager at the Institute of Community Studies. Tanya, thank you very much for talking to me today. Thanks for having me, John. Please could you tell us a bit about your role at ICS? I'm a researcher and my role on the National Civic Impact Accelerator is to collect and disseminate evidence of what is working where. So the idea is to identify not only good practice, but to really scrutinize how we know that practice is good and what can be learned from it and applied across contexts. How is that going so far? Is it, do you have any insights as yet you can share with us or is it still very much work in progress? Um, absolutely. So I think what we're starting to see, we've just been reviewing existing evidence. And what I can tell you is that there's an absolute wealth of evidence. It just hasn't been articulated unto, un, under a single agenda, under the Civic University agenda. So there's loads of evidence about the economic impact of universities on places, for example, about the role that universities uh, can play in social mobility, widening participation to education, adult education. And then there's loads of guidance for practice. So in areas such as sustainability, what we see is actually guidance so coming out of the department for education for example saying oh universities could be a source of connection to nature because they've got these fantastic estates that they could use for that but what we don't have is evidence of whether that's happening in practice and then whether that is translating to the impact that we'd like to see uh, so this this is very much what's missing. And I think it's symptomatic of where universities are in their thinking about their civic role, because I think there's fear of perhaps registering what's gone wrong or what hasn't gone as well as they'd like to. And there's reluctance um, to really invest resources in measuring impact I think that reluctance comes maybe again from that fear, not really knowing uh, if any impact can be proven, uh, especially because social impact can feel like a very diffuse thing. Uh, so yes, there's a gap in evaluating what's working, but there are loads and loads of ideas of what might work, and there is a lot of evidence to guide us towards areas that universities should be focusing on. Could you tell me a little bit about your kind of connection with civic activity and kind of your, your story, if you like? So I first came to the world of civic universities in Mexico City. I started working for a university called Centro University, which is a design school which has been around for only about 15 years. And it is a very rich university in certain senses. It has a lot of resources and it's a private university. And they decided to situate their campus uh, in one of the most problematic neighborhoods of Mexico City. So this is a neighborhood, it's called the America neighborhood, and it has a history of everything from gang violence, poverty deprivation, uh, to also a cultural heritage, a punk festival, um, encounters with police, violent encounters. So quite a complicated neighborhood, but located in a place that's a very strategic point of access for the city. Let's, let's call it this. So well located, but very complicated neighborhood. So what we have right off the bat is this stark contrast between what's inside the walls of the university and what is outside. And I was brought on 
as a community link. So I was part of a team of three at the Social Design Hub. Uh, we had a mix of skills, academic, uh, my own research and community engagement skills. And then the third person in our team was a person from the neighborhood. And what we did was we just spent time on the streets engaging people, bringing them into activities inside the uni, taking activities outside, uh, and just really trying to engage people to understand how they related to the university and how we could impact that to make it more positive. Uh, we were engaging with local institutions, um, local authorities, a local hospital, a school, another university, a sports center, and uh, we'd, we'd just be mobilizing loads of different activities or ways of engaging all these actors while facing, honestly, a very difficult context. Our, our measure of success was how many students had been mugged that week or how many people had gone in shot in the neighborhood. We'd usually have about one or two muggings per week of students. Uh, sometimes there were quiet periods and we worked hard for those quiet periods. Uh, and, and there were murders going on in the neighborhood all the time. Uh, but again, we'd work hard towards periods of relative peace. How, how did you like feel and identify when would be a period of peace, when would be a safer time for you to try and engage with people? Um, I guess I always felt protected because I quite rapidly managed to build relationships with some key people in the neighborhood. Could I ask, how, how do you do that? Because like the start of the conversation with any audience can often be the most difficult, but must have been really challenging. So. How did you even start to sort of broker those arrangements and relationships? Uh, what I would do is I would walk outside of the university nearly every day with a small amount of money in my pocket and nothing else. And I'd go to local businesses and I'd buy something from them and then engage them in a conversation. Uh, one of the people who was really key uh, was somebody who would look after cars. So, so in Mexico City, you get people helping you to find a parking spot and then looking after your car to make sure you don't get any pieces of the car lifted while you're doing something. And, and he was actually a former gang member and somebody quite prominent in the community. And having that relationship protected me everywhere I went within the neighborhood. So that was a contact you met through one of the local businesses, was it? Or just uh, so, so driving I, your car? Or? I showed up to, yeah. to park a car with him and I paid him and then I engaged him in a conversation. Wow. And I think the thing that I was always trying to highlight was to say, so, so this happened, this alien university landed in your neighborhood. Um, we want you to benefit from it and we want to hear what you need and try to respond to that uh, and I think people in the neighborhood had seen other institutions that weren't behaving in this way that would just completely shut off from their local context and so many would respond very positively and would find a way to derive benefits from the university. So, for instance, uh, get employed at the university, uh, take free courses or, or low-cost courses, um, enroll in a university degree with a high scholarship, something like this. Wow. So you come up from the perspective of like a social researcher and like that's your activity that day, you're going to engage and you're going to start these conversations, right? Yes, yeah, so I guess my role was to build those relationships. So a lot of it was outward facing, but also taking students and teachers along with me on the journey. So students would come to me with ideas of things that they'd like to do in the neighborhood. 
and I would help them to make it happen. Uh, so for instance, a student wanted to, to make an art installation about street harassment of girls and women. And so I brokered that so that a local community center let us use one of their walls. And so we made that installation and then left some chalk. And it was an interactive installation where people could write down their experiences of street harassment. And I worked with uh, just under 60 students on projects like that, um, which each, each of them were absolutely incredible initiatives with varying levels of success and just learning experiences for us. So for the students and for us as a community engagement team as well, just really understanding what kind of thing would be more meaningful for the local community eh, and how you could reach that sweet spot of a real exchange of value so everyone's benefiting. Is this a model that's used in other localities? Like, Have you seen this used in the UK, for example, that kind of model? Is it a sort of a well-used model? Uh, so I wouldn't say that it's used in the UK very much. I mean, the, the closest thing I've seen here are live projects or a um, or service learning projects where essentially through a course students get to work on a real life project. And I think what happens in the Latin American context is that there is so much need all around that there is less scrutiny about what people do to address that need. And that is a positive and negative thing, of course, but it's not unusual for university students to be trying to do something for their community. And there's less barriers around, for instance, health and safety. It, you kind of just do it. And so in Mexico, there is a requirement by law uh, so in order to graduate as a university student with a university degree, you need to complete 480 hours of community service to benefit the nation. That's, that's what it says in the Constitution. This is open for interpretation, of course, but the idea is for students to apply the skills that they've gained through their degrees uh, to something that will benefit others. Uh, so as you can imagine, this leads to a lot of wonderful initiatives, but it also means that there's students, undergraduate students, doing things in communities, and of course can also lead to debates about health and safety and ethical considerations. I must admit, with my kind of like compliance background, when you're telling me that, I'm just thinking, oh wow, what's the risk assessment form you need to fill out to go and do the work you just described? But that concept of civic work being embedded in your, in your degree sounds quite a positive thing. I mean, is that something you would advocate for or some form of that in the UK? I think absolutely. So it not only gives benefits to the communities that are involved in the work, but it gives huge benefits to the students that get to have some real world experience before graduation, uh, which is incredible in terms of understanding your vocation and even having a, some sort of volunteering experience, which you can leverage towards getting your first job. So let me tell you uh, about the, the kind of darker side of the work that I did. Uh, so as I was engaging neighbors and members of this local community, there was a lot of concern about gentrification. So people would say, am I going to lose my home? And I would always be assuring them that the community would be respected and that the university was not a threatening presence. What I later understood is that the university was quietly buying up a lot of the homes in the neighborhood. So uh, by the time I left, about 37 homes had been purchased in a local neighborhood of 
let's say 600 homes and this was for purposes of real estate speculation so the university clearly understood that their presence was going to drive up prices was going to change the neighborhood in a way that is broadly assumed to be popular uh, to be positive but without real concern for the negative impacts and the people that would be driven out of the neighborhood uh, so i understood that in this case my job was part of a strategy for gentrification in a way uh, it i also see that uh, my efforts had a positive impact on many people the good remains i stay in touch uh, with these wonderful people that i met in the neighborhood I see them thriving, I see them continuing to engage with the university, uh, which is why I remain optimistic, but it's also given me a dose of realism. Uh, so it's, it's taught me, uh, I guess, that great things can be achieved through the civic role of universities, but it also shown me to be cautious about the interests of universities and to be more aware of the driving forces behind civic activity and just have clarity about that. And of course, I'm incredibly grateful for the experience um, and it was above all uh, a learning experience for me and very, very formative. Uh, but I think it showed me that that grayness nothing is black or white and this this is one of those cases uh, since then i came to the uk to study a master's degree and i've gotten to be much more involved in research and now just engaging with the knowledge base around civic universities, but also from a perspective that is external to universities. So I think even when I was working within a university, I've always seen myself as on the side of community. I think uh, what where my passion lies is in ensuring that communities of place can be treated fairly and can derive benefits from institutions in their place and this hasn't changed so i'm now at the institute for community studies and i think our our focus is definitely on the community voices and the community perspective and when i say community i'm i'm talking about communities of place including all the actors all the institutional actors that sit within them so this doesn't exclude universities, it just decenters them. So it means thinking about the place first and then asking what can the university do for this place, what can the university derive from this place, rather than starting from the university and then looking outward to the community. How do you feel about the kind of the the reputation of universities in England at the moment? I'm wondering if civic activity not just as a PR exercise but as a real force for for positive impact is really crucial at the moment f from my perspective looking at how universities are kind of perceived in the media I just wondered if you had any kind of thoughts about that uh, well I have great admiration for the higher education ecosystem in the UK I think um, firstly just to acknowledge the incredible quality of the work going on at universities uh, so you have really amazing researchers teachers students and this allows for just incredible ideas to come out and uh, what i think is that uk universities need more of a propensity for action so what i observed just contrasting the latin american context and the uk context is that uh, universities here are focused more on understanding than on doing and that is of course very very valuable 
But I do believe we need to mobilize knowledge for it to be meaningful. So knowledge has to have some sort of impact or lead to some sort of change, eh, hopefully to some positive change. And that is what I would like to see more of here. And I think eh, the question is not only about dissemination, so making sure that information eh, is accessible and available to everyone who might be positively impacted by it, but also mobilizing it in terms of if the research is telling you that this change could create a positive impact, then the next logical step for me is to go and try to pilot that change. And I think this is something I, I observe a lot in the Latin American context. Uh, so there's very lean approaches uh, to trying to create positive change. There's often very little resources attached to projects uh, or initiatives, but people do it anyways. And it, this doing more with less this just like going out there and testing things I think is a way of moving forward more rapidly because if you wait for all the conditions to be just right they'll never be right so Tanya obviously you talked about your experiences in in Mexico and how important it was to to build those trusting relationships so how do universities start to do that in in, in England so I think a key thing is first valuing relationships. I think if you understand relationships as an incredible resource for change, a source of power and just as a priority, then you're more likely to get it right. I think too often relationships are cast aside or not prioritized and other things that might be prioritized are outcomes or individual aims or project aims but if you thought of relationships as your most valued thing they could become that uh, because I see relationships as the key the absolute key to to creating change in any sphere but particularly creating change for places. So we see that universities have this incredible wealth of resources, assets, you know, they have intangible assets like their academics, their students, their staff, they have their campuses um, and other institutions also have amazing resources that are complementary to those of the university the key to turning those resources and assets into change i think is finding a way to collaborate for a shared aim and building that relational power so it starts obviously at a very human level and that's often where it falls as well because you get a turnover or a rotation of staff and so when it's driven by an individual it's going to be very susceptible to falling down when that individual's not around for whatever reason so it really needs to be embedded into strategies or into projects and prioritized i think it's about valuing them and prioritizing them above almost everything else. Yeah. So sustainability, right? Yes. And in certain cases, maybe there's a model where a piece of work can become self-sustaining and self-generating the means to continue. Absolutely. And I think that self-sustainability is very much tied with community involvement. So we know that in universities, roles can change, people can come and go, students graduate, but the people who are part of a community and who have stake in that community, have social relations, have homes, they're going to be the lasting actor, let's say. So when you turn over power or control to people who are in that community for the long run and who really have skin in the game, 
then I think it's more likely to be sustainable. So we had the amazing opportunity to work with UKRA on a funding scheme called Community Research Networks, which was all about changing the locus of power in research to community hands. So all about collaborative working, communities working with universities, maybe with local government, with voluntary sector, community groups, but really shifting where the funding sits so that it's not the university holding that funding and that power and going out to communities and engaging them, but rather communities holding that funding and that power. And the hope with this is that you can achieve more sustainability because those communities aren't going anywhere as opposed to academics who can be moved around or projects that can end or research interests that can shift. Or funding that can run out. True. And there's a major issue with funding. And of course, I completely acknowledge the challenge that this presents to universities because they need to, or academics that want to conduct engaged research, for instance, need to constantly be applying for funding. And they don't have clarity about whether they'll have funding to keep going in their relationship. Uh, so this is, this is a major issue uh, for the sustainability of those relationships. I definitely don't have the answer on how to fix this, but I guess it's about making sure that the relationship precedes the funding and outlives the funding and maybe the funding is just a way to work together for a period of time but it's not the thing driving the relationship. I suppose something that kind of relates to that is the political terms of our of our government right we apparently are near another election and another four-year term and it's difficult enough managing short-term funding but yeah, getting involved with a government policy that may last or may just be something that sounds nice in a manifesto but doesn't deliver. There's just not that long-term kind of sustainable opportunity. Absolutely. And, and of course, that volatility is very threatening to relationships uh, because when the conditions are constantly shifting on you, it's very difficult to keep a relationship going. Mm. But governments can change, university, uh, un- governments can change, policies can change, but that university and that community still have to have that relationship and ongoing relationship and interaction. Absolutely. And regardless of what the next government will bring, I think what we're seeing from both the Conservative and the Labour Party is a desire for greater devolution. And this is giving the place agenda more and more importance. And what I mean by the place agenda is just focusing in on what institutions can do for their places, how they can collaborate with other institutions, including local authorities, including health uh, institutions, arts, heritage, other education institutions, and just uh, focusing much more on the local role more than the national or the global. I guess universities have, along with the other institutions in their community, need to kind of step up. Well, there's an opportunity to step up, but it's stepping up in the right way, which is meaningful and builds on these relationships. Absolutely. So I I see that a space has been created I, I won't call it a vacuum. It's an, an opportunity, a window of opportunity for anchor institutions to really take a driving role and a more active role in addressing some of the challenges that places are experiencing. Uh, so clearly many of our past approaches haven't worked because the UK still experiences deep inequalities between and within places and this affects humans in many many aspects of their lives and in many senses so why not try new approaches you know there's an opportunity to say let's 
let's have a go let universities have a go at addressing those challenges at doing things collaboratively doing it differently it's a bit like we saw with the covid pandemic so before that i think there were many perceived barriers to collaboration perceived and real of course i'm not saying there weren't very real barriers But as soon as there was an urgent challenge, which was a pandemic, those barriers were somehow avoided or, you know, there was a way to collaborate. Institutions found that way, did it very rapidly. And that collaboration led to amazing results in many different areas from developing a vaccine to community responses keeping people safe keeping people connected socially uh, addressing vaccine hesitancy so i think the pandemic really got different actors institutions stakeholders to rally pull together and and just have that collaborative response mm. And I'm really hoping that we get to see a similar thing for some of the other equally urgent challenges that we're facing. So things like the climate emergency, things like health inequalities, I think are as urgent as a pandemic. They just maybe don't always feel that way. And if we can act with that similar level of determination and shared purpose, I think there is a whole new horizon ahead of us of place-based working. I think that's a good place to end our conversation, Tanya. No, thank you very much, John. You'll find out more about Tanya's work and the work of the National Civic Impact Accelerator Program on our web pages. There'll be a link attached to this podcast. We'll talk to you again on another episode of Civicast very soon.